Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, attending today uh, today's meeting. Uh, we today with the first uh, webinar start the series of uh, three webinars presenting the uh, innovative technologies from uh, CIRMED projects with, uh, for application in uh, energy intensive uh, industries. Uh, my name is uh, Jakub Pluta and uh, I'm uh, from uh, ISNAP company, the Polish SME and uh, the dissemination leader of uh, the CIRMED project. Um, I will uh, firstly start with uh, some information that in this, e how this event uh, will, uh, will go further. And we will start with the presentations of uh, our panelists. And then after the uh, end of the event, you can, uh, end of the presentations, you can, uh, uh, there will be the question answer session when we, our panelists will answer your uh, questions. In uh, your attendee control panel at the top, you have the um, mark with the question mark where uh, uh, there's possibility to go into chat and uh, ask uh, the questions to, to us. So uh, thank you very much again for uh, attending this event. And uh, now I will uh, give the floor to uh, Mikkel Merchan from uh, Technalia, who is the uh, project coordinator to present the uh, overview of the CIRMED project. Okay, Mikael, uh, the floor is yours, so you have the control. Perfect. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Jaco, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this first session of this series of webinars organized to present the technologies that are being developed within the European funded CIRMED project. My name is uh, Miguel Merchan. I am a senior researcher at Technalia, and I'm also part uh, of the team Muted. that together with Maider Garcia Cortazar and Guadalupe Lobo, Lobo in charge of coordinating the activities of the project. In this first presentation, uh, I would like to briefly show an overview of what the project consortium is, is developing in the project. Okay, CIRMED is a project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under this grant agreement. It has a duration of 48 months, four years, with an uh, estimated of forcing ending date by the, uh, by the end of September this year. It has a budget of close to 10 million euros and uh, 15 partners from six different European countries with complementary profiles uh, are part of the consortium. The main objective of the CIRME project is to design, to develop and to validate in a relevant operational environment a solution to provide energy and resource flexibility to the energy intensive industries. The project addresses some of the challenges of the industrial sectors which are considered process industries. Some examples are this, uh, of this kind of industries are cement plants, steel making companies on, or non-ferrous uh, industries. Uh, all these three sectors are uh, represented by three different partners in the project consortium with the role of possible end users of the developed technology. Uh, processing industries are characterized because they are a huge consumer of raw materials, because they have to extract, transport and process these raw materials to manufacture semi-finished or high quality end products. And they are also huge consumers of energy, because the, this manufacture is carried out by means of physical, mechanical or chemical methods or processes which consume a lot of energy. Some of the challenges the European process industries, more in particular, is facing nowadays are the following. The first one is to try to reduce the dependency from third countries. 
In the case of raw materials, we know that there are some materials that have been already catalogued as critical raw materials by the European Commissions because we have uh, dependency for third countries or because we have them in uh, low amounts. So we need to uh, improve the recycling methods and increase the recycling rate of these uh, materials, this kind of materials. And in the case of energy, I think we all are, are aware at this moment of the problems and the consequence of consequences of this of this dependency. So I'm not going to go into it right now. The second uh, challenge is to try to increase the energy efficiency of process unit operations. If we do this, this we can, of course, reduce the overall energy consumption, and this can have an impact not only on the environment but also in the competitiveness of the European countries. The third uh, challenge is uh, the adaptation of the production processes to the increasingly sustainable but highly fluctuating energy supply. This is related to the increasing share of renewable energies in the energy mix, which means that we can have a fluctuating availability of energy in the future, which means that we need to adapt uh, the consumption or the model of consumption of energy of these industries to this new scenario that, that is coming. The next challenge is the reduction of fossil-based CO2 emissions. This is, of course, related with the climate change and with this uh, ambitious objective of the European Green Deal to try to reach this climate neutrality by 2050. And finally, and related, of course, with the previous challenges, we have the challenge of increasing uh, the competitiveness of the European process. Most of these challenges have been considered in the design of what we call the CIRMED solution. Schematically shown, uh, this solution can be considered as a process unit that can be integrated into an already existing process unit. The current process unit uses some raw material that is a transport using energy, of course, into a main product but also uh, in some byproducts and wastes. The idea is to take these byproducts and wastes and introduce them in the similar model. Okay, for what? To uh, through the through a revalorization process, try to obtain a revalorized byproduct with a higher commercial value in the market, and also to produce some inner waste or inner slag that instead has been managed as a waste and finished in landfills, try to obtain some, uh, some make some um, commercial, uh, try to commerce with this because it can be sold, for example, to the construction sector for different applications. Then we obtain another stream that is uh, the recovery of some materials that can be eventually be introduced again in the previous process unit thus uh, reducing the overall amount of primary raw material consumption. And at the same time, we can recover heat from the waste heat of these units, transform this heat into a useful kind of energy, and in this uh, way, try to um, reduce, again, the overall consumption of energy and the associated CO2 emissions. The solution has then an impact in the reduction of the primary raw material consumption, in the increase of energy efficiency of the industrial processes, in the reduction of fossil-based CO2 emissions, and in the reduction of production cost. The solution uh, is a modular solution that is integrated by a metallurgical furnace, an energy recovery device, and a digital platform. The first of the modules the one that will be presented in this first webinar is the ephemeral metallurgical furnace to valorize industrial metallic wastes. This is done using an efficient energy source, such as the high power thermal, thermal plasma energy, and using also biogenic carbon from biomass as reducing agent. The second of the modules, the one that will be presented in the second part of the series of webinar that will be held this Friday, 27th of May, is the rec waste that is a waste heat recovery system that transforms or recovers waste heat from fluid gases and transforms it into compressed air with the possibility of adapting the energy generated to
to the compressor demanded through a continuous variable transmission system and also an energy storage system. And finally, we have uh, the, um, the third of the modules, that is the one that will be presented in the third part of the series of webinar next Friday, 3rd of June, and this is a digital platform that is composed by physical and digital tools that are able to acquire and monitor process parameters on the one hand, but they can also predict and optimize the industrial process parameters. Okay, uh, with this, now I would like to take advantage of this uh, slide to thank all of you uh, for the attention, but to thank also uh, the 15 partners who have been working in, in this project for their, for their commitment. And of course, uh, I will be ready to, to answer the questions you may have at the end of the webinar. And here you have also my contact details in case you want to contact me anytime to yeah, try to know more about, about the project. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael, very much uh, for this presentation and uh, the presentation of the CIMED project. And now I will give the floor to uh, Ashir Subero from uh, CIDENOR to present uh, more uh, about the challenges and barriers that uh, the steel industry is uh, currently facing. Okay, thank you, Yago. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Asia Tubero, and I am a climate change uh, manager in, in CNR. And uh, I will make a, a brief introduction of uh, what is CNR and our Muted. interest in climate change and, and uh, circular economy. Oh. Yeah, it works. Go so, so. Uh, CNR is a steel company located in the north part of Spain. Uh, we have the steel plant in, in Basauri, uh, and we fit uh, small plants with, with rolling mills in, in some other uh, plants like Aftoite, Arrimos, and Vitoria. Uh, we produce special steel uh, long product and also uh, cold finished products, and our main markets are uh, uh, mainly automotive industry, uh, energy mining and, and so on. And our main figures, uh, you can see, uh, uh, we produce around uh, uh, 700,000 tons of steel per year, uh, with a total of 1,700 employees in our uh, five plants. So let's go with. Uh, uh, some uh, main figures about uh, about uh, climate change. Uh, we are uh, intensive uh, consumers of uh, electrical energy and uh, natural gas. Uh, we uh, consume uh, 650 gigawatts per year of uh, electrical energy, and the same is more or less 650 uh, gigawatts of uh, natural gas. And then we also uh, have uh, the consumption of carbon fossil, which uh, is about uh, 7,000 uh, tons per year. And this, uh, this is uh, about uh, 300,000 tons of CO2 uh, per year. So going to uh, climate change and circular economy, Climate change uh, will be, or it is, the main challenge for for the steel industry. Uh, I used to say that uh, it will be a relevant factor, but uh, in fact, uh, it is a relevant factor for uh, market requirements, uh, also in the re regulatory framework and uh, financial access. And regarding uh, circular economy, our goal is to uh, minimize uh, the impacts of our activities, uh, reducing, reducing, and recycling. And uh, our major concern, which is the landfill waste uh, uh, production, uh, our main goal, of course, is uh, uh, reduce, reduce, and uh, ensure the, the good 
quality of, of the product. And uh, in this case of the land, landfill waste, the uh, FML uh, in the frame of CIRNET project is a, a possible solution to deal with uh, landfill waste. Uh, this is our climate change uh, targets. Uh, we want to be neutral in uh, 2050 with uh, uh, 50 percent, 55 percent reduction in 2025, and uh, 60 percent reduction in, in 2030. Uh, as you can see, in 2021 uh, we had uh, 440 kilograms CO2 per ton. And the, the reference, which is uh, uh, 2005, uh, we had uh, this, this uh, 764 kilograms CO2 per ton. So we already achieved 42% uh, of reduction in, in emissions. And moving to your circular economy goals, uh, we are uh, in a in around the 88% uh, of waste recovery rate, which is a very high rate of, of recovery. And our goals, uh, yeah, it looks like a, a small step to achieve this 90% uh, by 2025. But uh, as we are in a very high rate of waste recovery, uh, its point of increase in this uh, rate is it's a bigger step. So. Uh, our goal is uh, this 90% in 2025 and uh, 95 in uh, 2030. So uh, we uh, see like uh, three different categories uh, of decarbonization barriers. Uh, first of all, technical barriers. Uh, there is a uh, limited availability of uh, renewable energy. Uh, this is a, a main uh, barrier for us as we are intensive uh, consumer of, of energy. Then uh, the optimal raw material selection and, uh, and use. Uh, it's not easy some, sometimes to change from, from, raw, from raw materials to, to new raw materials. And uh, also increasing energy efficiency and uh, minimizing the, the waste. Uh, regarding organization, organizational barriers, uh, there is a limited uh, availability, availability of uh, qualified staff. And of course, and this is the main one, uh, administrative and regulatory requirements. And regarding financial barriers, uh, this, uh, all of this uh, climate change strategy and, and uh, circular economy strategy uh, means uh, big capital expenditure for, for uh, industrial deployment. So it will be uh, uh, a big barrier for, for the, the steel industry. Well, this is uh, uh, the strategy of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, uh, as I said, our organizational footprint in 2021 is 440 kilograms CO2 per ton of steel. Uh, more or less 50% uh, of these emissions are related with the scope two indirect emissions. So uh, the main strategy for this uh, scope two, of course, is 100% uh, uh, renewable sources. And uh, we are working on that with almost 50% uh, uh, in 2022, uh, renewable sources for electrical energy. And then the, the rest uh, the rest of uh, uh, emissions is uh, from the conversion of natural gas around 36% uh, of total uh, emissions. And the main strategy for this uh, emissions is uh, the, the Green hydrogen as a natural gas substitution, and there will be maybe a small part with electrification process for for combustion processes. And the last uh, and the, the last part of 
emissions is this uh, about uh, 10 to 12 percent of of emissions we call it uh, process emissions uh, and they are related with uh, the consumption of uh, raw materials like uh, like carbons like uh, for alloys electrodes so here the the strategy will be uh, biomass uh, biochar or or biogenic carbons uh, uh, as a substitution of, of uh, carbon fossil carbon. And this is the roadmap for our, uh, uh, in order to achieve this neutral carbon in 2050. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we already uh, have this year 50% of uh, our electrical energy uh, renewable energy sources and that's why we are reducing from 2021 to 2022 uh, from 440 to 300 kilograms CO2 per ton. And uh, as a last uh, picture of our strategy, uh, we have three main strategies for for climate change deployment. So uh, the first one, renewable energy, as I mentioned, uh, we already have our 50% of our uh, electrical energy from renewable sources. Uh, we are working on increasing this, these numbers and we would like to achieve 75% uh, in 2025. And we are sure that we will get 100% in 2030. Uh, regarding hydro hydrogen, everybody's talking about hydrogen, but uh, the real fact is there is no uh, green hydrogen available. And the fact is that uh, in the steel industry, we are not using right now uh, hydrogen, we are using natural gas. So uh, the, the process of changing from natural gas to green hydrogen it will take time. So uh, we hope to start with. Uh, with a small percentages in in like five ten years in 2030, and uh, we will get 100% uh, uh, hydrogen uh, in 2040. As as uh, and regarding uh, biogenic uh, carbon, uh, we are already making some trials this, this year with uh, biochar. So uh, we hope to, to increase this, these numbers in 2025 until 30%, and we would like to achieve this 100% in, in, in 10 years. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, here you have my, my email. So any question you have or any issue, you can contact me wherever you want. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Asir. And uh, now I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, David uh, Egizabal from uh, Digimed, uh, partner of uh, CIRMED, uh, who will uh, give the speech about uh, the valorization of industrial metallic waste streams and then about the uh, more deep, go deep into details about the uh, exact FML technology. So, uh, so David, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jakub. Thank you, Good Muted. everybody. And thanks for attending the, the meeting. My name is David Egizabal. I am technical manager of, of Digimet. And uh, Digimet is a company focused in the development of solutions in the scope of valorization of industrial uh, wastes containing metals uh, with circular economy focus. We are going to, to talk in a first stage of, uh, about valorization of, of industrial metallic waste streams 
and after uh, we are going to go in deep in the in the work and in the development of the CIRMED project and uh, female solution. Uh, it's, uh, it is well known that the future of European energy intensive industries will be based on sustainability and the resource efficiency of energy and materials are key aspects on, on this objective. Uh, taking care about the efficiency of raw materials, uh, it's, uh, this efficiency can, can be achieved or we can work on, on different aspects, but mainly in optimization and innovation in processes, in digitalization, and of course in improvement in, in waste management. Regarding to the waste management, uh, we have two, two, main, two main aspects to, to, to highlight, to work. The, first of all, of course, the reducing of the waste production. And in this term, uh, we introduce all of the, the scope of the eco-design, all of the scope of uh, working on, on different kind of materials and improvement on, on, the, on the production processes. And the second one is uh, once the, the waste is produced in the optimization of the of the of the treatment of the valorization of this of this waste. And uh, in this uh, this optimization of the waste treatment, there are several aspects to take into account: in recovery ratios of most valuable elements, combination of waste, this possible combination of waste for treatment. Uh, all of the transport that and logistic costs uh, to analyze if uh, self-management and circular economic focus uh, can provide an improvement on the on the waste treatment and so on. And of course, uh, also the processes and the technologies. Uh, most of the wastes require more than one recycling step or technique to become again raw materials or high quality raw materials. In this sense, it is uh, very common to combine hydrometallurgy, pyrometallurgy, and, and electro refining, electro hydrometallurgy processes. And uh, in this sense, uh, though during last years, uh, pyrometallurgical processes, high temperature thermal processes have been seen as uh, not environmental friendly. Uh, I would like to argue in favor of these technologies because uh, high temperature, temperature treatment thermal processes can be efficient from both operational and environmental point of view, are key in the treatment of most of the industrial waste is uh, containing metals. And uh, they can be environmental friendly by using, for example, uh, plasma heating technologies that can use renewable sources as energy source. Uh, speaking a little bit about the, the plasma technologies that have been developed in the, in the, in the project, uh, the plasma jet is created uh, when high energy current is generated between two electrodes uh, causing the ionization of the of the plasma gen gas. Uh, depending on the application, plasma gen gas can be can be different from, from air to different kind of inner gases like nitrogen or argon, and also certain gases uh, with potential heating value like uh, conventional combustion fossil gases, fossil fuel gases, or also uh, syn gas coming from biochar production. This this com uh, combustion processes would be by combining with oxygen or, or air. Uh, in the picture, uh, uh, we can see as heating gradients on plasma jet can be adjusted on demand. And, uh, and here, a typical distribution for metallurgical holding and refining processes. But uh, take care that depending on energy intensity, this, uh, this blue area, this uh, heat transfer area, can reach temperatures over. 3,000 degrees. Uh, some reasons for uh, using plasma. Uh, it's a clean technology. The use of plasma as heat source minimizes heat emissions. As, as said before, renewable energies can be used for these high temperature industrial processes. It is versatile as different kind of plasma torches can be adapted on, on demand. 
is an innovative uh, technology with, uh, with uh, long, uh, long development and uh, we are in early stage of, of development of it. Uh, efficient uh, as using single or hybrid plasma heating technologies, the energy consumption at, at these processes is minimized comparing to conventional heating technologies. And finally, it's a safe technology as fulfills the objectives of the European Union related to environmental safety and occupational health regulations. Uh, reducing energy consumption by using heating system with this possibility of, of using renewable energy sources is a primary goal for the for the sector and for the industry. And here, an uh, image of a transfer high power thermal plasma jet in operation at technology facilities during the project. And uh, as I said, uh, take care that the that under the, the name of the plasma, uh, different configurations can be developed depending on the objective. We can have transferred or non transferred plasma torches, different kind of electrodes from graphite to uh, coolant torch and so on. And uh, taking care about uh, the, the waste streams uh, from all industrial wastes, uh, those containing metals are very important from, from valorization point of view. Uh, these uh, waste metals can be found in different for, forms from, from physical, but, but especially uh, from a chemical point of view. Uh, we can find the, the elements in an elementary form, in metal form, uh, as a oxide, simple oxides, but also as complex compounds. And this metal forming waste is, determines the, the recycling conditions and, and also the recovery potential of, of these valuable elements. Some examples of this kind of waste is, uh, which can be treated in a more efficient way with, uh, with this circular economy focus and with these uh, technologies are, for example, electric carbonate dust. Uh, primary and secondary copper smelter filter dust, uh, turnings and polishings dust from, from copper alloys foundries. Uh, waste is coming from stainless steel production, uh, catalytic converters and other waste is containing PGMs. Uh, waste flows from uh, scrap uh, sorting, crushing and cleaning processes. Uh, waste is of electronic and electric equipment. And, uh, and also uh, waste of permanent magnets containing uh, high valuable rare earths. And uh, taking care of this, uh, of this uh, waste, of the situation of the, of the industrial uh, waste is containing metals, uh, the female focus uh, is uh, to develop the, the solution, the tool, of uh, recovery uh, the valuable elements in three potential flows uh, in one furnace in one step in single step uh, be able to recover the valuable elements in metal fraction as filter dust concentrate in the in the filtering of the of the exhaust flue gas as also as inner fraction as a result of the of the slag which is the part what is not metallic and what it is not gasified during the processes. In this very very basic uh, drawing scheme, we can see how the, the inputs of the of the furnace of the process are uh, for uh, from an energy point of view the renewable source energy of plasma and potential uh, support from from biogenic uh, carbons and uh, also the waste dust uh, mixed with other kind of raw materials. Uh, these other raw materials can be other kind of wastes, but also uh, binders and conditioning agents to agglomerate uh, and, uh, and be able to uh, briquette or pelletize the, the waste uh, prior to, to us to the furnace in the feeding system. As a result of the treatment, uh, we can find uh, um, metal fraction, metal ingots containing iron, copper, other kind of elements with, with high gasification point and which uh, are uh, relatively easy to reduce. Uh, 
and another part we have the, the inner fraction that can be used in the, as, as gravel in the construction sector. And as a result of the filtering of the, of the flue gas, we can find the filter dust concentrate. Uh, usually, the most valuable element in this kind of concentrate is the, is the zinc oxide. And as a conclusion uh, of this uh, preliminary assessment of the metallic waste streams, uh, what makes the uh, technology suitable and versatile for the, for the treatment and valorization of different kinds of metallic waste streams? Uh, in the first stage, uh, we have to highlight that it is possible to operate with, with different uh, base metals. Uh, we can operate with uh, iron, with copper, with aluminum, with spe special alloys and adapt the furnace uh, process to each waste. The high power thermal plasma heating uh, allows accurate control of process temperature on demand from uh, 300 degrees to over 2000 degrees. Uh, depending on the waste treated, recovery of high value elements is, is made in three different flows. The filter dust concentrate of the flue gas, the vitreous and inner fraction uh, of the slag, and uh, high value metallic elements in the molten metal bath that are recovered as ingots. Uh, it's a technology of easy operation and maintenance and energy efficient and environmental sustainable. And now uh, we are going ahead uh, with, the, with the developments, specific developments of EFIMELT uh, in the scope of CIRMET. Uh, project. Uh, as told, energy intensive industries uh, produce huge amount of wastes and these industrial wastes are usually processed at, at centralized treatment plants. Uh, these centralized treatment plants uh, are necessary, uh, are very important to achieve all of the, the objectives of, of treatment but, uh, but there, uh, the wastes are usually processed in order to obtain most, but not all, uh, valuable elements. Uh, one of the reasons of this inefficiency is the difficulty to adapt process parameters to a specific amount of waste and their characteristics and needs. So on, uh, we, we find that high amounts of waste is still landfilled after treatment, as the process are not fully op optimized. And uh, it, it, it uh, runs to an early end of life landfill. The female solution focus is, uh, is based on the circular economy. A female is modular as uh, different uh, furnaces can uh, operate in parallel and, uh, and we can uh, have uh, in, in a single plant uh, different uh, different lines, production lines, small production lines, uh, fully adapted to the to the needs of the of the waste uh, producer. It is uh, flexible, as uh, we can uh, start and stop on demand. Uh, the technologies uh, allow these technologies allows to to easy easy operation in the in the maintenance and in the technical and logistic stops of the of the factory it is versatile because uh, we can adapt to different kind uh, different kind of wastes and process parameters the same furnace can operate for different kind of alloys different kind of wastes uh, it is uh, a possibility of in-house or, or next to in-house treatment and uh, provides a self-management uh, opportunity to, to waste and byproduct producers uh, with a next to zero waste uh, focus and the possibility to, to minimize uh, a lot of the CO2 emissions as uh, from one side we can, we can use uh, almost fully renewable energy source in the, in the electrification of the the supply of electricity of the plasma torch, uh, but also because the, the use of is small and have been demonstrated in the scope of the, of the project. 
If we compare this uh, female focus with the current centralized uh, treatment plants, we find that, uh, that, uh, that in terms of the possibility of in-house cell management, uh, the flexibility and modularity, uh, the, the approach is worse than, than, the, than the female circular economy solution. And uh, in the other aspects, uh, though uh, there are uh, during last uh, years a lot of improvements have been made, it's still worse than in the, in the female solution. Here, a summary in a table of the, of the, the comparison of the, of the female with uh, versus centralized uh, plants regarding the modularity and flexibility. Uh, obviously, a, a huge centralized plant has no the possibility to 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 uh, to be uh, flexible and modular and female solution, yes. Uh, the versatility limited at centralized plant and uh, at female, uh, it is uh, one of the uh, important aspects that, uh, that, uh, that provides uh, opportunities for the, for the users. Uh, regarding to the HG emissions, uh, those, uh, those uh, related to the energy uh, in the centralized plant are variable, uh, depending on the energy used in these in this, uh, huge kilns and, and furnaces, and uh, low, uh, thanks to the, to the electrification at uh, females using the, the plasma heating system. And the heat here related to the chemistry, to the reduction of the oxides of the, of the wastes, uh, usually is medium high in the centralized plants, though, uh, they are also making huge efforts in the, the employ and the use of, of biogenic carbons, and uh, and it is low in the in the female uh, thanks to the potential use of of biochar. Uh, regarding to the landfilling, uh, is uh, is vari variable in the centralized plants uh, depending on the on the kind of waste and the treatment, uh, next to zero in the in the case of female and the transports uh, costs and uh, emissions also related to the, to the transport of the waste is is usually high in the centralized plants and it is minimized in the, in the female bar in house or next to the house self management is is possible and here the the, the female concept the female form is developed in the in the project uh, here we have the three recovery flows in, in one furnace. As you can see here, you, are, uh, you can see a molten metal bath where the, the material is treated, the waste is, are treated, and uh, thanks to the, to the heating of the, of the plasma torch and thanks to the accurate control of the uh, process parameters, we can divide, we can break this, this waste in three flows, the metal uh, containing iron, copper, or different kind of elements, depending on the depending on the waste, the inner fraction that it is obtained in uh, a slag, which is uh, divided, separated from the molten metal, uh, though different density and characteristics, and finally the filter dust coming for the filtering, the cleaning of the of the flue gas. Uh, at the captation system, which usually is uh, rich in in zinc oxide, and uh, and it is usually also the, the most valuable element in this fraction. And uh, regarding to the some examples of the female application that we are we have been working and we are currently working, uh, first. Uh, we have uh, chosen the electric furnace dust. Uh, it is the main hazardous waste produced by the steel making industry. Uh, it is the filter dust collected in the fume captation system of, of electric furnace. Uh, blast furnace uh, and electric furnace are both main routes of steel making. And while uh, blast furnace route employs mainly iron ores, electric furnace route employs uh, mainly ferrous scrap. Melting scrap produces about 1.5 to 2% of EFD waste 
And this EFD contains high amounts of valuable elements as zinc, from iron, lead. Uh, three material flows are barolized in, in this uh, approach in next to zero waste process. And the zinc is the highest value element and it is recovered in the exhaust flue gas. Similar waste is to EFD uh, coming from uh, copper industry, filter dusts from uh, secondary and primary copper smelters can be treated in similar way. And in this case, apart from the zinc recovery as most valuable element, uh, the recovery of copper and other metallic valuable elements obtained that metal ingots is key objective of this kind of processes. The image is in the, 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 the bottom part of the, of, the, of the slide. You can see the, the exhaust uh, gas of the of the, the output of the gas of the of the furnace, furnace in operation and some images of the of the zinc oxide concentrate. The output of the of the vitreous inert slag from the female system. And uh, finally the iron ingot suitable to melt down again in the electrical form. Another example of the of the female application is the non-ferrous scrap management uh, wastes uh, during a scrap sorting, uh, crushing, refining treatment processes using also hydro or electrolytic techniques. Different kind of wastes and byproducts are obtained. Uh, depending on the origin of these wastes, this can be filter dust or or different kind of moods, concentrated moods. Anyway, all of these wastes contains significant amounts of uh, oxides of copper, tin, and other high value elements as silver, gold, and PGMs. In absence of significant elements uh, with low acidification point, the objective in this case is adapting with accuracy the process parameters for the efficient reduction of the oxides into molten metal. Uh, in the images, you can see the, the non ferrous dust concentrate and uh, after the process, the, the casting process, and two kinds of, of ingots suitable for meltdown in bronze and brass foundries. Uh, on, the, on the left, uh, a combination of, uh, of a kind of secondary bronze with uh, high amounts of copper and tin, and on the, on the right, uh, more pure uh, tin ingots to use in the, in the bronze foundries. In this uh, application example, uh, from the three flows, the most uh, important one, the most valuable elements are collected in the molten metal flow. And uh, another application uh, could be the, the rare earth permanent magnet recycling. Uh, permanent magnets are key parts of several industrial and, and electronic devices, as uh, all of you know. It is estimated that Europe imports about uh, 14 tons per year of permanent magnets, uh, including those assembled in different kinds of equipment. And though they contain significant amounts of high value rare earths, at the moment the recycling ratio in Europe is estimated about 1% or uh, uh, for sure below 5% of, of uh, the whole amount of the, of the wastes. Presently, several initiatives uh, are running to solve this issue, and new recycling metallurgical technology is one of them. Rare, rare oxides are obtained as a concentrate in the, in the slag of the process. And uh, here you can see the evolution from the permanent magnet waste crushing to the concentrate of uh, rare oxides that can be used for further hydrometallurgical processes. And, and other uh, applications to, to produce again uh, the magnets. This is the typical example in which the, the, the most valuable element is collected in the, in the slag of the metallurgical process. And uh, just to, to finish some, some comments as conclusions. Uh, it is expected that current economic situation with high prices and, and supply shortage, shortages of raw materials uh, will continue in the future. Alternative uh, to conventional raw material supply is needed. Uh, optimal recycling and valorization of industrial waste is not an option. It is a, a compulsory action for, for all of us, for the European industry companies and countries. Uh, just to highlight again that 
pyrometallurgy, high temperature processes are necessary and important step in the valorization of lots of these industrial wastes containing metals. And uh, in this sense, female is an option as efficient solution from, from technical, economical and environmental point of view. I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to, to, to present uh, our uh, work in the, in the FIRMED project, uh, to, to thank all of the partners involved in the, in the project, and obviously those more involved, involved in, the, in the development of a female solution. And uh, if any question, if any doubt, here are my, my contact mail. So um, thank you very much. For attending the, the webinar. Okay, uh, thank you, David, for uh, your presentation. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, Muliel uh, Marchand from uh, CEA to present uh, the result of a study about uh, the how the use of biochar can help reduce the CO2 emission in uh, the waste treatment process. So, uh, Muriel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. My name is Muriel Marchand. I'm uh, working in uh, CEA, Commissariat Energy Atomique in France, which is a, a research uh, company uh, working on in the field of uh, energy and uh, nuclear and uh, new renewable energy applications. And uh, I'm in charge at, at CEA of the work package concerning the biochar uh, production and test uh, with a team of uh, several engineers and uh, technicians. So I'm, I'm going to present the potential uh, use of biochar uh, for the applications of the CIRMED project. So, if we, I don't know if I can, oh, sorry. Okay, so I just put this mouse. Okay. So, as I has been mentioned by my colleagues of Technalia, and Digimet and, uh, and uh, CIDENOR. Um, the context of this study concerns the European energy intensive industries, namely metallurgy, uh, responsible for more than 15% uh, of all the coal uh, consumed today in Europe. Uh, these industries, uh, as mentioned by, by CIDENOR, namely, are characterized by undervalorized byproducts and waste and uh, by the use of fossil fuels uh, that generate high amounts of greenhouse gases, uh, mainly CO2. And the CERMET project uh, aims at proposing modular solutions to process in the same plant raw material, uh, byproducts and waste, as well as to use a recovered and sustainable energy supply. Concerning the GHG issues, CEA is studying in CIRMET uh, the substitution of coal-derived coke by a torrefaction biochar to serve both as a heat provider and a reducing agent in the metallurgy process. Torrefaction, you can see here, is a, a soft, sorry, a, is a soft pyrolysis process that can be applied to a biomass or a waste, and that will uh, generate uh, some gases, permanent or dry gases and condensable gases, and a solid uh, with properties close to coal. Uh, this, is, um, this is done under inert atmosphere, such as nitrogen or a CO2. doesn't it work? I cannot go to the next 
slide. What's wrong? That's okay. So if we go now to the state of the art concerning this uh, biochar technology, uh, the literature on the substitution of coal by a thermally treated biomass uh, at the moment mainly focus on slow pyrolysis biochar produced at temperatures higher than 400 degrees centigrade. Nonetheless, some authors show that torrefaction biochar may uh, have the same behavior in combustion as a high uh, content, volatile content coal. The current substitution rates at the moment do not exceed 20 persons, or which has been found in the literature, with a future target around 40 persons limited by the biomass feedstock availability. Three main parameters are reported to control the behavior of the coal or biochar in the process. The carbon, and specifically the fixed carbon content, which has to be higher than 75%. This study uh, has then required some biochar with very high mass losses. Uh, the second parameter is the ash content that does not affect the process but has an economic impact on the production if the volatiles are not valorized. And finally, the ash composition uh, to limit the inorganics combustion related issues. Nonetheless, uh, some inorganics such as silicium uh, are known to have some graphitizing effects acting as if the carbon content was higher and its effective value. Okay. So, if we go now to uh, the results, the study itself, uh, in the project, at first, uh, the torrefaction studies have been made at lab scale on six biomasses, free woody and free agricultural waste, in order to set the operating conditions for the future studies at pilot scale, also to assess the quality of the torrefied solid and to tackle the issue of fire risk linked to severe torrefaction of biomes. The solid mass loss kinetics has been studied in thermal gravimetric analysis for temperatures between 250 degrees centigrade and 350 degrees to increase the severity of the thermal treatment up to the maximum temperature being reached in the pilot scale furnace. Proximate and ultimate analysis of raw and torrefied biomasses allowed assessing the biochar quality, namely carbon and ash contents. Figure one and two show the mass loss kinetics respectively for sunflower shells and oak. They highlight that temperature has a greater impact on the mass yields than torrefaction duration, and that the remaining solid masses reach a plateau after 45 minutes of treatment. The final remaining solid mass are 20 to 30 percent for the woody biomasses and 30 to 40 percent for the agricultural biomasses. Once the conditions have been set from the lab scale study, some tests have been made on the pilot scale CEA furnace, Centauri, with oak and poplar for 45 minutes under the, most, the two most severe torrefaction conditions, 300 and 350 degrees centigrade, this one being close to pyrolysis, a bit out of the scope of torrefaction. This is the, the highest temperature that can be reached in the furnace. So you can see here the Centauri furnace. It is a seven meters high, two meters in diameter and 36 tons in weight, multiple earth technology furnace that allows the continuous production of up to 100 kilogram per hour of torrefied biomass. The furnace is heated by 12 natural gas burners, two on each floor, and the wood chips biomass injected at the top 
of the furnace is rubble and torrefied, turning downwards to the outlet. The gases produced are vented to a post-combustion system. Thanks to a specific instrumentation, all the process parameters such as temperatures, residence time, gas and solid flow rates, etc., are recorded. Thanks also to additional gas analysis, proximate and ultimate analysis, the mass and energy balances can be derived. The three photos on the left show the graduate severity of torrefaction from the left here, which corresponding to the raw biomass, to the right, uh, which corresponds to a torrefaction at 350 degrees centigrade with a coal looking biochar. Figure four shows a bar graph of the mass yields for oak and poplar and for the two conditions. For the 300 degrees torrefaction, 30 to almost 40 of the solid mass has been converted to dry and condensable gases depending on the biomes. This mass loss can reach almost 70 persons for the 350 torrefaction condition. The right-hand side table shows that, for instance, uh, for oak, uh, the lower heating value can uh, be increased up to almost 27 megajoules per kilogram, and the fixed carbon content can be uh, increased to 60%. Um, these values can reach 28 megajoules per kilogram and 65% for the poplar, by must approaching the 75% target that has been defined, defined from uh, the previous uh, literature state-of-the-art study. The representation of the molar hydrogen to carbon ratio versus the oxygen to carbon ratio in the so-called von Krevelen diagram in figure five shows, sorry, shows by comparison with the literature that this biochar is very close to coal H over C versus O over C molar ratios. The global energy balance calculated from the Santoré measurements highlights the energy requirements for the biochar production, such as, for instance, biomass heating or water and gas heating. They are balanced by the energy supplied during the torrefaction process. This kind of bar graph serves as a basis for the technical and economic analysis or the life cycle analysis that are performed in the project to assess the potential of industrial application for the biochar. Finally, on the right, you can see that some uh, combustion tests have been made. Uh, this is in the Anya furnace in CEA at temperatures up to 1,300 degrees centigrade. Uh, it can be seen from, from the, the photos um, that um, the combustion on the left of the photo, uh, the combustion went uh, properly. And you can see on the right of the photo, uh, the ashes uh, after the combustion. And it can be seen from this that no traces of flagging or fooling uh, were detected. This confirmed the interest of this biochar for the CERMET application. So, as a conclusion, um, the biochar properties get from severe torrefaction proved close to the requirements for coal substitution. The torrefaction thermal treatment 
is lighter and less energy consuming than pyrolysis due to the temperatures lower than 400 degrees centigrade. And also a good behavior was observed in combustion. From this, one ton of poplar biochar was produced uh, in the project for further tests in FE melt. And if we can talk about the future and the next steps, uh, a promising step uh, will be uh, the potential use of the syngas produced during the biochar manufacturing for the plasma torch heating system of the metallurgy process. This is uh, what uh, Digimet uh, presented uh, in the previous presentation. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I will be pleased to answer your question if you have any. Thanks. Thank you very much, Muriel. Uh, so uh, now the next presentation will be done by uh, Giovanna Sof from uh, QLaven about the assessment on environmental and economic impact of the presented technologies. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you, Jakub, for the presentation. Thank you all for being here. And thank you all to, the, to all the previous muted for the very interesting presentations. I am Joan Nasov from um, a postdoc at KU Leuven. And um, today I will be um, presenting the study on the environmental and economic assessment of the Thermet solution with a particular focus on the FML furnace. The study was conducted uh, by my colleague Andrea Di Maria, who unfortunately could not be join us today to present it himself, but I will forward also all your questions and feedback. So, um, okay. Yes. So as we have heard in the previous presentations, the Thermet solution and the FML furnace in particular is an innovative and flexible solution to um, support the development of more clean and circular um, industrial processes by, for example, recovering metallic waste streams um, and by reducing the climate change uh, impact of the process by the use of bio-based materials such as biochar to support and complement the technical analysis that we've seen in the previous presentation and to further understand the potential of the Cedermet solution and the FML furnace um, um, in this transition towards a clean and circular um, industrial sector, uh, an environmental and economic analysis was further conducted. So the analyzed system is the one summarized in the figure and it was based on a pilot plant in the, the north of Spain. As you can see in the figure, the main input was a metallurgical residue rich in non-ferrous metals oxides, uh, together with the metal scraps for the, me the molten metal bath, the metallurgical coke, and energy in the form of both electricity and natural gas. Uh, the main outputs resulting from uh, the, the furnace processing are um, metal alloy rich in copper, an iron fraction, and uh, zinc oxide concentrate from uh, the flue gas cleaning system. Um, these, um, these streams are then recovered as a zinc oxide concentrate, secondary metals, so in, as copper, and the inner fraction is, can be recovered as natural aggregates. And these avoid the production of the uh, related and alternative products from primary resources, uh, as you can see at the right of the figure. The electricity is also recovered from the cooling down of the flue gases and is used also to avoid the production of primary uh, electricity. And another important factor is that the processing of these metallurgical residues avoids the landfilling of the residues that is also considered in the study. An alternative scenario is also considered um, by addressing the use of biomass and therefore of biochar as a metallurgical coke replacement. The system, uh, the system was analyzed for the treatment of a, a capacity of um, for the treatment of 1,020 tons per year of uh, metallurgical residues, which represent uh, the capacity uh, um, of the furnace over a year, and all is used as functional unit for the study. 
So the goal of this environmental and economic analysis was to understand from an environmental perspective, for example, the trade-offs between raw materials and energy required in the processes and uh, instead the uh, potential recovery of metals um, and materials and energy. And from an economic perspective, what, were the, what are the main drivers and barriers for the further development of the solution? So for the, the tools used for the environmental and economic analysis are the life cycle assessment and life cycle costing respectively. And these are tools used, um, commonly used uh, to support this analysis and that take into account the whole life cycle of the product or system under study. Um, after the definition of the system boundaries, which include all processes included in the study, as we saw in the previous slide, and the functional units, which is here considered as the um, waste treatment capacity over a year. Um, these, these tools include the uh, life cycle inventory uh, and, life cycle, and the impact assessment. In the life cycle inventory, all the main uh, um, relevant input and output of the study system are, are compiled and quantified. And this, this means, for, for example, from an environmental perspective, materials and energy at input, as well as uh, emissions and waste streams in output. And from an economic perspective, all costs and revenues associated to uh, all the processes. In the impact assessment stage, instead, all the, um, all the results from the life cycle inventory are translated into environmental impacts and uh, economic indicators. For the environmental impact assessment, the, met uh, the environmental footprint 2.0 method was used. And here in the slides, you can see the main uh, environmental uh, impact results uh, shown for different impact categories um, and for the scenario with COPE used as a reducing agent. Um, each of the column represents one of the impact categories and each layer represents the contribution of one input or process to the overall impact. So all impact categories have different um, units and therefore cannot be really compared um, with each other. Um, and, and here actually all impacts are presented as normalized impacts and each contribution therefore is presented as percentage to the total impact. What I want to focus on here is that uh, in each, for each impact category, the positive part of the graph actually represents environmental impacts, meaning negative effects on the environment while the negative part of the graphs uh, are, yeah, the, uh, the graphs represent um, um, environmental benefits. So the avoided impacts due to, for example, the recovery of materials or energy. And what I would like to focus on here is that actually the climate change impact category has the highest impacts and it is mainly due, as we can see, by uh, the, to the electricity consumption during the processing of the waste streams and to the CO2 emissions, the direct CO2 emissions from the use of coke in the metallurgical furnace. On the other hand, instead, the uh, main environmental benefits, so the avoided uh, impacts, are associated to the recovery of uh, um, zinc uh, in purple and uh, copper, for example, this yellow with the uh, horizontal lines, and from the avoided landfilling of the metallurgical residues. Um, yeah, so the main benefits uh, are, so we can see actually that there are benefits from the recovery of the, of the, of the re metallurgical residues in the recovery of secondary raw materials, but there are also some bottlenecks, for example, by the high electricity consumption. Here are also the results uh, for the scenario with the biochar use as metallurgical coke re uh, replacement. And we, uh, we mentioned how the use of bio-based materials such as uh, biochar can lead to a reduction in the climate change impact. And this is due to the fact that emis uh, CO2 emissions from biochar uh, use are biogenic emissions and are commonly accounted as climate neutral. And this is what we, we can see here, uh, uh, as we can see that the Actually, the climate change impact is significantly lower in the biochar scenario, and this is due to the lower impacts related to direct emissions that actually lead to a net negative impact and therefore climate benefit, so environmental benefit for the climate change impact category for the biochar scenario. 
going instead to the economic analysis, um, the economic results were first calculated in terms of present value, which represents the value generated by the technology over its lifetime reported to the present value of money. And it's, as we can see in the equation, it's uh, estimated as the sum of yearly cash flows discounted, thus discounted by the future value of money. And we can see in the graph that we have the result for the present value over a 25 year lifetime of the infrastructure. And we can also see all the contribution and the, for the flow, the cash flows, either in revenues or costs for the different uh, inputs or processes. As we can see, um, the positive value for the present value indicates that actually the revenue over the, it's li of the lifetime of the technology is high or higher than the sum of the costs leading to an, actually an economic profitability of the solution. The main uh, processes or factors that actually contribute to the revenues are uh, the um, recovery of zinc concentrate and cover, while on the other hand, the main factors that contribute to the costs are the electricity consumption in the process and the cost of labor. And here we can see that actually uh, the electricity consumption is, as for the environmental part, a bottleneck also in the economic um, potential, while the recovery of um, secondary raw, material, raw materials and specifically the metal streams uh, are um, also here considered as high benefits. Um, and the, uh, another economic metric used to, to assess the economic viability of a process is the net present value, or NPV, which is estimated as the present value plus the capex or capital cost on its investment uh, as negative value, and allows to estimate whether the profits, uh, the profits obtained during the lifetime of the infrastructure balance the initial investment. And when this balance happens, and therefore the NPV is equal to zero, um, this is called the break-even point, and all profits actually obtained after this break-even point are economic benefits. In the case of this study, the capex was not uh, available yet due to the emerging nature of the technology, and therefore to estimate actually the maximum potential investment that the industrial uh, partners could um, could put in. The, in building the technology, let's say, um, the NPV was set to zero, and with our calculated PV, um, the, cap the capex was estimated for the whole life cycle of the um, infrastructure and for specific values of the payback time, being the payback time, the time required to reach the break even point. And you can see in the graph the relation between the available capex and payback time. By considering a payback time of five years, which is considered a realistic and acceptable, acceptable value for new industrial processes, the maximum investment uh, obtained uh, was of uh, 2 million 500,000 uh, euros. And a similar estimation was actually done for an upscaling scenario that you see here in the blue curve, uh, where the, actually the functional unit and therefore the um, the system was analyzed for 5,103 tons per year. And here we can see how the curve is actually much more steep. And uh, this is due to the economies of scale that leads to higher, um, uh, uh, higher ben benefits and therefore a higher uh, present value and therefore a higher maximum potential initial investment that is actually 9.2 times higher than the one for our baseline scenario. Um, so now, um, given the high volatility of market prices and actually the strong link between risk and uncertainty, an uncertainty analysis was further conducted. Uh, and the goal was actually to understand the potential variability of the present value uh, with the variability of the input values of the uh, costs and revenues associated to all processes. So to perform this uncertainty analysis, a Monte Carlo simulation was conducted uh, by first uh, assigning a probability to distribution uh, to each input value for each parameter with a vari variation of plus or minus 30%. And then to, by uh, conducting uh, 100,000 simulations um, where for each simulation, a different value from the distribution of each variable was taken. 
And this gave us a result, a probability distribution for the present value, uh, which is a normal distri distribution in this case, with a mean value of 7,086,000 euros and a standard deviation of uh, eight, around 855,000 euros. And well, what information actually this um, uh, graph gives us is that uh, there is a 68% probability for the present value of the technology to fit in the, um, in the range uh, as mean value plus one times the standard deviation at 95% probability for it to fit between in the range of mean value plus two standard deviation and uh, a 99.7% probability for it to fit between uh, the mean plus three uh, times the standard deviation, which gives us an indication of what actually the value could be also taking into account the variability of the prices. And so to conclude, um, we the environmental and economic analysis have shown um, the potential um, benefits of the re recovering the metallurgical residues in the ethanol furnace and the steel mat solution in general and that actually it represents an environmental and economical viable um, circular solution. Uh, the main um, factors are that electricity consumption is actually a bottleneck in both environmental and economic results, um, um, but that uh, from an economic perspective, the recovery actually of the metals leads to um, an economic viability. From an environmental perspective, uh, the recovery of secondary metals and the avoided landfilling of residues are uh, lead to um, significant benefits, but that of course, from a climate change perspective, the CO2 emissions from the use of coke in the ethanol furnace have a high impact as the electricity consumption. This leads us to, um, uh, to say with the, the comparison with the biochar scenario that the use of biochar could lead instead to significant uh, uh, reduction of climate change impact and therefore to increase the climate change benefit. And uh, related to the electricity consumption, we heard in also the previous presentation how the use of renewable energy sources for the electricity use in the furnace could also uh, contribute to achieve the objective of reducing the climate, uh, the CO2 emission and climate change impact. And this, of course, is uh, something to uh, look forward to. And as last consideration, uh, I was always wanted to, I also wanted to add that this LCA and LCC and results, so the environmental and economic results, are to be considered as an iterative exercise to identify the opportunities and the potential hotspots and points of improvement as we've seen throughout the presentation. The, present, the, the study conducted by my colleague and, all, and the other partners of the project is actually uh, published and available online at the link that you can find here. And having said this, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you to all the partners for their contribution to the study and to the project. And um, I'm always available for any um, question and I can also forward your um, questions and feedback to my colleague, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Uh, so now, uh, this was the last presentation. Uh, I would like to thanks to all the uh, panelists for the, uh, the, what, the information they uh, gave us today. And uh, now we can go to the uh, question answer. Okay, so uh, we have uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, firstly, I would like to ask, uh, there's a question to uh, Asia from CDNR. Uh, what could be the issues to solve the industrial implementation of biochar? Okay, uh, thank you, Jakub. So, uh, regarding uh, biochar, the, the main challenges are uh, quality and availability. The fossil carbon uh, used in the steel industry is around uh, 85 and 90 percent carbon content. So uh, we need a biochar with uh, high carbon content and a stable analysis. And uh, there are a lot of different types of biomass biochars. 
uh, which uh, we already analyzed, and a few of them are above 75% uh, uh, of carbon content. So uh, and, uh, as the biochar has not been uh, valuable until now, uh, there are not a lot of uh, biochar producers in the market that uh, can guarantee a stable, good, uh, stable and good uh, quality. So uh, as the demand increase, uh, we hope that uh, the market will pull the availability and the, the quality of, of biochar. Okay, thank you. I hope it's uh, met the expectations of uh, the audience. Uh, the next question is for uh, David from Digimed. Uh, David, uh, concerning the FE melt furnace based solution, uh, you have commented that it is modular, versatile, and flexible. Is there any limitation in size? I mean, is a minimum or maximum that is limited by the technology, or the limitation comes only from the material to be treated? <clears> Hi, <throat> hey, thank you, Yago. Uh, well, uh, as uh, in all of the in all of the processes, the dimensioning of the of the facilities has to be made taking into account uh, the production needs, and in in these terms, the, it is very important to know the characteristics of the of the waste. Uh, these uh, these characteristics of the waste uh, make a kind of uh, not the limitation but conditioning of the geometry of the of the furnaces. Uh, depending on if the most of the material has to be recovered on the on the molten metal flow or it has to be uh, gasified and, and recovered in the in the filtering system uh, apart from that uh, it is important to remark that uh, that the, the female is a, a self management tool is a circular economy tool so on uh, also uh, the the dimensioning of the furnace is usually made taking care of the production of the, of the producer of the of the waste, the generator of the of the waste. Uh, there are uh, common production sizes from some hundred tons per year uh, up to uh, ten thousand uh, ton per year. And uh, in case any any uh, customer, any waste uh, generator or uh, waste uh, treatment company needs uh, higher uh, capabilities, production capabilities. Uh, the modularity of the of the facilities helps to to increase the, the capacity. But there is no uh, there is no a real physical limitation. It's more a, a correct dimensioning depending on the waste uh, characteristics and uh, generation volumes of the user. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is also question, uh, two questions uh, to uh, Muriel. Uh, the first one is uh, concerning the feedstock. It seems that uh, you use virgin wood to produce biochar, and uh, an industrialization of the process may increase the competition of the biomass feedstock. Could other types of feedstock, such as waste, uh, waste wood? Be used. Yes. Uh, in the CERMET project, it was the first studies on the possibly possibility of using uh, woody biomass uh, for uh, biochar production. So uh, we were looking for a very low ash content biomass. So this is why uh, the project focused on, on wood, uh, such as oak of, or poplar. Uh, but in some other projects uh, related uh, also to CIRMET, uh, some other types of biomasses, such as agricultural waste, uh, which are less expensive and, and potentially easier uh, to provide, uh, are, are studied. Um, their uh, drawback is that, are, uh, is that their uh, ash content is higher than uh, for a woody biomass, but um, the first studies show that uh, um, they, they can be handled properly as a biochar in the process, in the metallurgy process. So it's a promising uh, feedstock for uh, industrialization. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, the second question uh, also to you is uh, mm -hmm. that uh, no slugging and uh, falling during torrefied biomass combustion sounds uh, very promising. However, I wanted to ask how long the test was held and what heating surfaces in boiler were examined uh, regarding slugging falling. And there is also mm -hmm. the second part. If uh, you perform the tests uh, with uh, torrefied biomass grinding, and what uh, if any problems were encountered during the test? Okay, so concerning uh, the combustion tests, uh, they were performed in a small uh, a mobile grid systems for uh, several hours of combustion. So, uh, for sure, this is not uh, representative of what you could have uh, for hours and hours of, uh, of uh, treatments in an in industrial uh, metallurgy system. But um, we, we, um, we noticed that when you have a, a, a very problematic biomass, such as a very high ash content biomass, uh, some problems of combustion in combustion can occur very, very quickly as soon as you begin the combustion. So uh, concerning the determination of this uh, occurrence or not, uh, the various surfaces of the, um, of the furnace, the combustion furnace were uh, checked and really no traces of, uh, of slagging or fooling uh, was observed. So this is uh, very interesting. As I mentioned previously, um, if we go to some agricultural waste, uh, the the ash content will uh, and uh, the ash composition will change. So it has to be tested also. It's it's, uh, it's promising. And concerning uh, grinding, uh, we did not encounter some specific grinding problems because when you uh, when you torrefy or pyrolyze your biomass, you will get um, a product, a solid which is easier to, to grind, which which is more uh, friable. So it's uh, very interesting. Um, the difficulties, the issues are more on the pelletizing or brick bricketing. Uh, because well, when you, if you torrefy much your uh, biomass, you will get uh, a product which uh, will be very different from the raw biomass and less easy uh, to to pelletize or to um, to brick it. So this may be the issue and the the difficulty. So in the project, it, it was tested also. Uh, by um, a subcontractor uh, concerning the, this pelletizing of, of the biochar. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, this was the last question. So uh, at the end, I would like to thanks to all the panelists for uh, their presentations and uh, answering the questions from the audience. And uh, of course, I would like to uh, specifically give many thanks to uh, all of you who registered and participated to this event. Uh, apologies uh, for that we are a little uh, out of time at the end, but still, uh, I think a lot of valuable information has been provided in the presentations and uh, in questions. Here uh, you can uh, follow our project in our website and uh, our social media. And uh, I would like to also inform you that uh, this webinar has been recorded. And uh, soon after the event, uh, the recording will be published in our YouTube channel and uh, our website. And uh, to all of the attendees, the link will be uh, sent. So one more time, thank you all for uh, your presentations and for you, all of attendees, to participate in this event. So thank you very much. Have a nice day.